So, uh, Honorable Minister, Mr. Nishid Desai, distinguished panelists, distinguished participants and friends, we are pleased to welcome you at this important webinar. We do hope that you're all keeping well and safe during, during this pandemic. We have a very distinguished panel with eminent speakers at this very important webinar, during which the panelists will deep dive into the recent developments and innovation in the Mauritius International Financial Center. The financial services sector is a key economic pillar for Mauritius, and as an international financial center, it positively contributes to the global financial system. While the panelists will briefly uh, will brief you about Mauritius as an international financial center of choice and repute, which is trusted by global investors, be it sovereign, institutional, or individual, the key message is Mauritius serves as an attractive and competitive business hub, and there are many opportunities for investment in the domestic economy as well as for cross-border investment. We do hope advantage of these opportunities and put Mauritius on top of your list as investment jurisdiction. We invite you to be with us with the, for the next 90 minutes and please post your questions, queries in the Q&A. These will be answered after the distinguished panelists have intervened. So now, today we are going to... There is some background noise. Uh, if somebody is unmuted, please mute yourself. So today we are particularly de delighted to have among us the Minister of Financial Services and Good Governance of the Republic of Mauritius, Honorable Mahen Kumar Siratan. Now I have great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Minister and I will invite him to speak. So uh, Honorable Minister holds the ministerial portfolio of financial services in the government since uh, November 2019. Previously, he has served as Minister of Agro-Industry and food, food Security from December 2014 up to November 2019. Honorable Minister has been elected as a Member of Parliament since 2010. Honorable Minister started his political career in 1990 as Member of the ruling party in the current government. Professionally, the Honorable Minister started his career as Auditor in UK upon his return to Mauritius in 1991 he has continued to be associated in the financial sector. Honorable Minister is a qualified chartered accountant, being a fellow of the, of the Association of Certified Accountants. He is also an MBA holder. Uh, over to you, sir, Honorable Minister. You, we have you, you have the floor. I'd like just to, to say again, hello, everyone, and uh, pleased to have you with me to be able to share some of our, of our uh, views on how things are in Mauritius. Uh, I was saying earlier on that uh, we are all facing some difficult times across the world uh, with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And as you all know, most governments in the world are giving top priorities in saving lives. But in the, at the same time, we all know how the economic activities are being, uh, have been slowed down and uh, they're all facing difficult times ahead. And given that, you know, still we, we have to do our utmost in uh, securing the lives of our people, but at the same time, do everything that we can to be able to uh, get our economic activities back again on track. I mean, I must say uh, here in Mauritius, uh, we, were, we were very kind of, uh, uh, propped in addressing this problem of uh, COVID-19. And we had to, like many other countries, had to uh, close down all the activity for some time. And fortunately, I must say, this has proved to be very effective in the sense that we have uh, been able to uh, contain the uh, propagation of the virus. And uh, now for the last four months, we haven't had any uh, local cases of transmission of the virus, which is something that allows us today to be able to get back on our uh, activities. Uh, although that, I must say, that all uh, the activities have resumed, especially the tourism sector, which is dependent on, uh, on uh, visitors from abroad. 
which is still one sector that is uh, suffering from that particular uh, uh, pandemic. Otherwise, uh, all the other activities are back to a quasi normal situation. And that is why we feel that uh, it's about time that we open for business. And uh, we would like to welcome those uh, companies and investors from uh, India and, and, and elsewhere to uh, look into uh, what they can do uh, here in Mauritius. I mean, we all know in times of crisis, there are also opportunities that arise. And uh, if we are here, again, uh, trying to converse through that digital platform, it shows how much uh, we can adapt to new situation in times of, you know, of, of that kind of crisis. And we all see how financial uh, deals and businesses are being conducted online these days. So uh, I think the fact that we are here sitting and talking to people from across the world shows that uh, we are operating in a new normal situation uh, nowadays. So, you know, uh, coming back to uh, Mauritius, uh, the uh, International Financial Center, Probably uh, 30 years back when we started this sector, we never thought that we're going to be, uh, uh, at this point in time, uh, we're going to, to have uh, gone that far. And uh, it, had, it has grown quite rapidly. And I must say, this is uh, one sector which is playing a very important role today in our uh, economic development. And in terms of its contribution to GDP is something which is uh, very uh, vital for the progress of our country. And over the years, we have shown that Mauritius as an uh, international financial center, it has become a trusted jurisdiction of choice and of, and of substance as well, made by individual and also by institutional investors. And we have seen so many multinational uh, companies, corporations setting up here, and also FDIs that have decided to domicile in uh, in uh, in Mauritius. So all these have helped in Mauritius becoming what it is today as a reputable international financial center. And uh, I think we, uh, at the level of the government, we have been very responsive to the uh, demand uh, and the needs of the investors community in terms of uh, the rule of law while adopting international uh, best practices along with the uh, conducive business friendly environment, ease to do business, the network of tax treaties and investment protection agreements, robust and well-regulated banking system, free movement of capital, favorable time zone, favorable tax policies, cost competitiveness, availability of talent, bilingualism, amongst others. So these are the factors that have all contributed in bringing Mauritius as a international financial center where it is today. So we are committed to continue in our approach and efforts to provide the best practices and regulatory environment and maintain the attractiveness of our jurisdiction such that investors feel even more comfortable to enhance their presence in Mauritius. So ladies and gentlemen, as you are most probably, probably aware, in February 2020, Mauritius was placed on the list of jurisdiction under increased monitoring of the Financial Action Task Force. I mean, this FATF list is usually referred to as the gray list. In as much as it is a list where countries have to, unfortunately, where they have been demonstrated that they have some strategic deficiencies in their anti-money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism regime, but which has also provided high level commitments to address these deficiencies within a specified timeline agreed with the uh, 
Secretariat of the FATF. Nonetheless, it is worthy to note that the FATF does not call for the application of enhanced due diligence when you're on that list. And uh, it only kind of encourage whatever country, whatever uh, corporations working with Mauritius to at least be aware of the fact that we are under that kind of monitoring. So I myself, I led the delegation uh, to attend the FATF plenary meetings held in Paris uh, in February of this year. And I must say, uh, they do acknowledge, the FATF do, did acknowledge the fact that we have made significant progress following the uh, mutual evaluation report that came out in uh, 2018, when the, look, the, the regional body of the FATF, the ISAMLAG, carried out that exercise. And they did uh, uh, recognize that the fact that we have, over the last uh, one year of the post-observation period, following that report, which came out in 2018, in terms of technical compliance, we have uh, moved uh, a long way in terms of uh, uh, being compliant and logically compliant of those uh, 40 recommendations. I must say at this point in time, uh, 35 of them, we have uh, been able to uh, reach the level of, of being compliant and largely compliant, which shows our commitment in addressing those uh, different uh, recommendations of the uh, uh, FATF, uh, because we have uh, brought a, a number of amendments to our legislation, legislative framework so as to be uh, in compliance with those different uh, uh, requirements. So uh, I must say uh, that work is, is ongoing. Uh, we are uh, at all level uh, doing everything that is uh, possible to be able to be fully compliant with all the recommendations. Unfortunately, I must say, uh, uh, after the uh, the listing on the uh, by the FATF in May uh, 2020, the European Union uh, unjustly, I must say, uh, and much to our surprise, uh, placed Mauritius on its list of high risk third countries which they commonly refer to as the blacklist. And this is uh, something that came up following a new methodology that, ha that they have put in place, which we were not at all consulted. And uh, we were not, uh, neither we were uh, allowed to provide any explanation to be able to at least make any kind of representation to the commission prior to uh, being included on that list. So I must say, uh, prior to that uh, listing, be it on the FATF or on the EU list, both the EU and the OECD had confirmed that Mauritius' uh, tax regime is in conformity with their governing standards. So the listing now uh, on the of course, uh, uh, EU and the FATF took us by surprise. But nonetheless, we, we are committed to, to take all the steps to be able to adhere to those, uh, those international st uh, standards of good governance, transparency, and taxation. And as you probably are aware, Mauritius is, uh, has also incorporated the FATCA and the CR CRS requirements into its domestic laws. So. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mauritius is again committed to the integrity of the domestic and international financial system, and as such, has initiated implementation of improvements to the effectiveness of its EML CFP system. Mauritius, uh, at the government level, we have given our high level political commitment to work with the FATF and ISAMLAG to implement its action plan, which contains five recommended, five recommended actions, namely a risk-based supervision for global business and the designated non-financial businesses and professions, access to basic and beneficial ownership information by competent authorities, competent capacity building of law enforcement agencies, 
to conduct money laundering investigations, including parallel financial investigations and complex cases. Risk-based supervision for the non-profit organization sector and implementation of targeted financial sanctions through outreach and supervision. Back in order to ensure an expeditious completion of the action plan items and to address the issue of the EU list, Mauritius has, has adopted a number of bold policies and measures, namely an interministerial committee was set up under the chairmanship of the Prime Minister himself and meets regularly to review the FATF and EU issues. A revised FATF implementation action plan whereby the process will be completed by the end of this month, so that is one year well ahead of the, of the scheduled plan. So, ladies and gentlemen, as a resident jurisdiction, Mauritius is at the vanguard of spearheading the right engines to choke up an expeditious adoption of additional bold policies and domestic regulatory reforms in the financial services sector post scrutiny by coveted international organizations and standard setters. I'm therefore pleased to inform you that in July 2020, that is this year, the anti money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism miscellaneous provisions act 2020 that seeks to accelerate our jurisdiction's compliance with recommended international best practices and norms of the FATF of the FATF has been enacted this act 19 legislations have been amended to complement the steadfast legislative framework to ensure that Mauritius is not plagued by the stigma of being used as a conduit for illicit transactions and tainted money. The Act emanates from the principles and standards of a rule-based financing service, financial services sector and cogently reveals the, in, the unwavering determination whilst reaffirming the unflinching commitment of government to adhere to international best practices and to enhance the effectiveness of the jurisdiction's AML CFT measures. Very important to say, this new legislation provides added comfort to the international investing community to continue using Mauritius as a hub for their investments and bears testimony to the sound repute of Mauritius to staunchly affirm that the authorities and institutions that provide any leeway for unscrupulous and dubious use of the jurisdiction. Friends, the history of Mauritius and India are intertwined since 1835, when our Indian forefathers set foot in Mauritius as indentured laborers to work in the sugarcane plantations. Since then, the ancestral traditions, values, and languages have been maintained through generations. The friendship between our two countries has grown stronger over the years. This bond is being further cemented and is at an unparalleled height today, as evidenced by the recent collaboration between Mauritius and India, such as visits by the Honorable Prime Ministers the two countries, the revised tax treaty between the two countries, resumption of and concluding the negotiations on this comprehensive economic cooperation and partnership agreement, the SECPA, support of India for development of projects such as the Metro project, the new Supreme Court building, hospitals for cancer and ENT amongst many others. India has supported Mauritius in its fight against the pandemic by providing medical supplies. India is a major development partner for Mauritius. It is supporting Mauritius to develop the landmark metro project, which has been built by Larsen and Tubro, 
The first phase was e inaugurated by the former prime ministers of both countries in October last year. This year, on the 30th of July, on the occasion of the joint e inauguration of the new Supreme Court building in our country, the Honorable Prime Minister of both countries is stressed on the partnership between our countries. Back in his speech, the Honorable Prime Minister of Mauritius highlighted that this partnership between Mauritius and India to develop the new Supreme Court building marks another momentous day in the relationship between India and Mauritius. While the former Prime Minister of India stated that Mauritius is at the heart of India's approach to development partnerships. The partnership between the two countries transcends mere friendship and cultural exchanges as Indian companies are actively participating in economic activities in Mauritius while the Mauritius International Financial Center continues on one hand to be a hand to be a major contributor of FDI to India and to service Indian investors for their for the India outbound investment more particularly in Africa here allow me to mention that SEBI wrote amendments to regulation 5A4 of the Securities and Exchange Board of India Foreign Portfolio Investment Regulation 2019 regarding jurisdictions to be eligible for category one foreign portfolio investor. Thereafter, the Ministry of Finance of the Government of India acted swiftly to issue the order specifying Mauritius as an eligible country for the purposes of these regulations, thus once again demonstrating the relationship between our two countries. Ladies and gentlemen, Mauritius provides an unparalleled environment that is conducive for companies to invest, trade, and conduct businesses. Mauritius is attractive for many reasons, which include competitive tax regime, no capital gains tax, tax exempt dividends, avoidance of double taxation, 100% ownership by foreign investors, no exchange control, ease of doing business, occupation permit for 10 years, presidency through investment, political and economic stability, rule of law, strategic location, favorable time zone, unique lifestyle, and so on. So as you can see, Mauritius is an attractive destination for Indian companies that have invested and are successfully operating in Mauritius in various sectors. Now, there are more than 100 Indian companies that are present actually in different sectors that include financial services, banking and non-banking, manufacturing, healthcare, hospitality, and tourism, telecommunications, ICT and digital technologies, film industry, freeport and logistics, retail and distribution. I can name a few companies that are present. I mean, Bank of Baroda, SBI, LIC, Indian Oil Corporation, Oberoi Hotels, MTML, Dr. Agarwal High Hospital, and so on. So this, again, the amount that India is a major trading partner for Mauritius. Trade between the two countries remains largely in favor of India, rather, I must say though. As an illustration, in 2019, Mauritius exports to India were 848 million rupees, that is about 21.2 21 million US dollars, while imposed from India is to that 27.6 billion rupees, that is about 
690 US dollars, million dollars. And like I said, Mauritius and India have finalized, have negotiated and finalized this SECPA, and which is being awaited for signature. And I'm sure that's going to be happening very shortly. The SECPA will provide the opportunity for an even greater trade and investment flows between our two countries and is yet another instrument to further cement our relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, the financial services sector contributes 11.8% to the GDP of Mauritius. It is the second most important sector of the Mauritian economy. The sector recorded a growth of 5.2% last year. Some 12,500 global business companies are licensed, while more than, while more than 1,000 funds are domiciled in Mauritius. As an internationally recognized jurisdiction of repute, the Mauritius IFC is home to a number of international banks, legal firms, corporate services, investment funds, and private equity funds. Leveraging on its state-of-the-art infrastructure, modern and innovative legal framework, and ease of doing business regime, the Mauritius IFC offers a panoply of competitive financial products and services, including private banking, global business, insurance and reinsurance, limited companies, product and sale companies, trust and foundation, investment banking, global headquarter administration, amongst others. As we continue to diversify our financial services sector with the objective to enhance its competitiveness, new products will be introduced in line with the recommendations of the 10-year blueprint. As announced in the budget 2020-2021, these products include the central bank digital currency, an insurance wrapper, variable capital companies, an inaugural Sukuk insurance by the, by the central bank, green and blue bonds by the central bank. In addition, new frameworks for digital banking, private banking, and wealth management by banks will be put in place by the Bank of Mauritius, and a dedicated venture capital market will be set up at the Stock Exchange of Mauritius for startups and SMEs. As a trusted and reliable international financial center, Mauritius, the preferred platform for investment in India by foreign companies. Thus, the Mauritius, the Mauritius IF, IFC has established itself as a major source of FDI for India. For the financial 2019-2020, Mauritius IFC contributed 8.2 billion US dollars of FDI into India, representing 16.5% of India's total FD, FDI. Cumulatively, from the year 20, 20, 2000 to 2001 to financial year 2019-2020, FDI inflows in India through Mauritius IFC have reached 142.7 billion US dollars, representing 30% of the inflows for that period. Ladies and gentlemen, besides being a sophisticated platform for cross-border investment, the Mauritius IFC is well poised to play a crucial role to attract investment and promoting prosperity for and across Africa. The IFC explores new competitive business venues and a wide spectrum of investment opportunities for global companies to invest in Africa. Strongly bearing in mind its political, social and economic stability and regulatory, regulatory framework, the Mauritius IFC offers a certainty to global investors to look up 
for Africa as an investment destination. The attractiveness of India and Africa as investment destination has risen in recent years on the back of strong economic growth and improved business environment and better investment regulations, high rates of return on investment and a raising consumer market. Africa's resource endowments and energy security concerns in India have also stimulated investments. You must know that Africa is a continent of 55 countries with a population of 1.2 billion Africans. Trade between Africa and India has increased more than eightfold from 7.2 billion US dollars in 2001 to 59.9 billion US dollars in 2017, making India Africa's fourth largest national trading partner. Accounting for more than 6.4% of total African trade in 2017, up from 2.47% in 2001. The impressive growth in trade between Africa and India stems from a mix of factors, including growing stock of foreign direct investment undertaken by African and Indian corporate entities, and deepening economic and political ties illustrated by a number of strategic initiatives, such as Focus Africa, launched by the government of India in 2002 to boost trade and investment between Africa and India, and the India-Africa Forum Summit launched in 2008. Despite the impressive rate of trade growth, which has enabled Africa and India to diversify their trade destinations and in the process mitigate their exposure to global volatility and adverse terms of trade shocks, trade between the two parties is still driven by a limited number of products. Primary commodities and natural resources account for around 75% of Africa's total exports to India. India's exports to Africa are dominated by refined petroleum and pharmaceutical products. Over the last five years, these two products have accounted for about 40% of total exports into African markets. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a famous African proverb that goes like this, and I quote, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, end of quote. Mauritius, as a trusted jurisdiction, is here to support and accompany you in your cross-border investment initiatives through the panoply of products and services of its IFC. We welcome you to Mauritius for your investment. Mauritius is a safe, secure, and politically and economically stable, stable democracy. Our country has been a favorite destination for foreign investors for the factors that I have mentioned earlier on, but also because of the attractive and conducive investment and business environment that includes a favorable taxation policy, preferential market access, network of tax treaties, and equally very important, the ease of to do business. Improving the business environment has consistently been the top priority for government. Thus, the global ranking of the World Bank ease of doing business, Mauritius has progressed from 20th to 13th position and is first in Africa over the last 15 years. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I strongly encourage you to consider the Mauritius IFC and take advantage of the various benefits that Mauritius can offer. To stay safe and be healthy 
and thank you for your attention. I was saying thank you, Honorable Minister, for your very enlightening and uh, speech, and which uh, you have in which you have clearly spelled out governance strategies, initiatives for the financial services industry. At the same time, you have delved into the uh, India-Africa relationship, extended into that, which I think, as you rightly say, I mean, Mauritius plays the ideal platform for investment into Africa. And very importantly, the, rel the relentless drive to position this industry to an even higher level. I have the pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Faraz, Faraz Rajid. Faraz heads the financial services cl cluster at the Economic Development Board uh, Mauritius. He started his career as an investment executive at the former Board of Investment and has also served as the officer in charge of the ex-financial services promotion agency of Mauritius. Uh, he, is, uh, he is qualified as an LLB. Uh, he has got his LLB from the University of London and also his LLM in international economic law and policy from the School of Law of the University of Barcelona. Faraz has uh, authored and also co-authored articles in trade and investment laws in transnational journals and United Nations publications, and was part of the drafting team of the World Investment Report 2012 and the International Investment Agreements Negotiators Handbook 2012-2013. So I now invite Faraz to make a presentation on the Mauritius IFC and how EDB Mauritius facilitates the life of investors in the country. Over to you, Faraz. Thank you, Siuraj, for this kind introduction. Good morning or good afternoon to all of you joining us live. Um, my name is Faraz, and I'm going to make a presentation on the Mauritius jurisdiction and uh, how it is that we act as an international financial center. Um, so to begin with, um, the Economic Development Board of Mauritius is the apex government entity. Um, operating under the aegis of the Ministry of Finance of Mauritius with four clear mandates. The first one is strategic economic planning. Therefore, we act as a think tank to the government of Mauritius in economic enablers for the jurisdiction. The second one, which is a core mandate, is the promotion of investment and trade, as well as Mauritius as an international financial center. The third one, the, minister, the Honorable Minister alluded to it earlier on. Um, one of our key mandates is to look at the business environment in Mauritius and ensure that uh, business um, is facilitated for the international investing community using the Mauritius jurisdiction. And the fourth one is everything that pertains to branding, including the country branding and multi-sectoral branding of the jurisdiction. Now, I was talking about the Mauritius jurisdiction. First and foremost, let's talk about the country. Um, it is a small island in the Indian Ocean with a population of 1.3 million of people. We have a sustained economic growth of 3%. The GNI or GDP per capita of the jurisdiction is 12,740, which is um, a couple of months ago we have been noted as a high income country by the World Bank. Um, however, you know, the pandemic is going to have economic repercussions globally and Mauritius, of course, will be affected. It will not be spared and probably we would have to relook at the high income jurisdiction classification. Um, we, are, we have a Moody's rating of AA1, which is an investment grade rating. We are one of the four countries in this part of the world, in the African continent, which has this rating. And we are the only international financial center in this part of the world having an investment grade. We have a Westminsterian parliamentary system with free and fair elections um, every five years. We have a conducive time zone of GMT plus four. And one interesting thing for our international investing community looking at us at the moment, we have a hybrid legal system. Therefore, we have the British common law and we have the French Napoleonic code imbibed in our judicial system. The last court of appeal of the Mauritius jurisdiction is the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the House of Lords, in the United Kingdom. Now, let me talk a little bit about the Mauritius International Financial Center. There are four limbs 
of what we offer to the international investing community, but we principally service two streams, the multinational corporations and the exceptionally affluent high net worth individuals. Now, in terms of multinational corporations and investment and cross-border services, we have a panoply of products, including headquartering, treasury management, limited partnership acts, collective investment schemes, um, investment holding entities, trust and foundations, which I'm going to delve in a little bit more later on. All of this is supported by the banking architecture, including conventional and Islamic banking, but also um, investment banking and private banking. At the same time, there is a community of service providers in Mauritius that service the international investors around the clock. Uh, we are a bilingual uh, system. At the same time, I mentioned earlier that we have a strong banking architecture. The capital adequacy ratio of our banking architecture is 18.2%. As you are aware, distinguished guests, the requirement of Basel is to have a capital adequacy ratio of 12%. So we are very liquid, but we are still very resilient and very performing. The stock exchange has over 200 plus listed securities. And in terms of service providers, um, Mauritius is one of the few jurisdictions that have the most number of accountants per square capita, but at the same time, we have over 500 fund managers, over 3,000 uh, lawyer accountants, and around 750 um, lawyers. Now, I've been saying that Mauritius and the Honorable Minister mentioned it earlier as well. Mauritius is the hub, is an IFC of repute for companies doing business across the world, especially in emerging market. So just to put a figure on that, um, there are 12,000 companies domiciled in Mauritius, but which are conducting business outside of Mauritius, which is what we call the category of global business companies in Mauritius. Out of these 12,000 companies, there are approximately 1,000 global funds, collective investment schemes, if you would want, and all of those are supported by 188 corporate service providers, which are management companies. The financial services sector has had a growth rate, a sustained growth rate in excess of 5% for the last five to six years. And there is a GDP contribution, as the Honorable Minister mentioned, 11.8%. The financial services sector in its entirety um, employ directly more than 15,000 people. Now, these 12,000 companies, they act as a hub for cross-border investment. And just to give you the geographical spread of investment, you would see that most of our capital exporters, that is to say investors using the Mauritius jurisdiction to access the world, come primarily from the United States and Europe, so North America and Europe. And the recipient is primarily Asia and Southeast Asia. We are growing increasingly for um, the African continent. But in a nutshell, um, the amount of capital that flows in the jurisdiction and the stock is approximately 390 billion of US dollars at the moment. Now, there is a multitude of advantages of why you should choose the Mauritius jurisdiction. The Honorable Minister alluded to it earlier. There is a conducive environment for doing business, including incorporation of a company within two hours. There's no, no minimum capital requirement. There is, of course, 100% foreign ownership, and there has been no exchange control since it was abolished in 1994. At the same time, we have a hard and, 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 and flat 15% of taxation, both for corporates and income. And then there is, of course, a partial exemption tax credit given to certain types of income which are generated outside of Mauritius. Including to that, there is a number of, uh, of nitty gritties of a financial center, including um, a multilingual workforce, including state-of-the-art infrastructure um, and developed uh, physical infrastructure. Now, um, in terms of one of the reasons of why Mauritius is that conducive environment is because of our extensive 
um, network of bilateral in, in, um, network treaties, right? So there are two treaties predominantly for cross-border investments. These are bilateral investment treaties and double taxation avoidance agreements. We have 45 bilateral investment treaties and we have 52 double taxation avoidance agreements. And at the moment, we are showcasing on your screen the treaties um, which we have with the African market. Now, let me delve a little bit about the bilateral investment treaties, which is predominantly an important segment in risk mitigation of your investment and as to why you need to use the Mauritius International Financial Center. The bilateral investment treaties to which Mauritius is a signatory of are mostly the first generation of bilateral investment treaties, which have very strong investor protections. One of the few protections that the BITs provide is compensation for losses in case there are civil strife. Therefore, you get national treatment. You're using Mauritius, you're investing in a country from India. Had you gone directly to your, to, to your investor country, you will probably have to align yourself with the national laws. And in case there was a strife and the government was compensating, you would have to go to the domestic courts. However, if you structure through the Mauritius International Financial Center, you can always go to the World Bank, exceed the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, or you can go to ad hoc arbitration to resolve your dispute. So you get national treatment, you get guarantee against expropriation, you have arbitration. All our treaties have free um, repatriation of capital and profits. And there is one interesting thing, which is the subrogation clause. Therefore, if you're using Mauritius, you can take a political risk insurance. For instance, from the MIGA of the World Bank, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, or from one of the service providers. If you are investing in a country and your assets have been expropriated, at the outset, the political risk insurer pays you your compensation and steps in your shoes to sue the host government. And this is the reason as to why we use the subrogation clause. And this is why the political risk insurer would use the subrogation clause. That is to say, as an investor, you have peace of mind that you have a conducive environment and you have free repatriation of capital and profits. But should your investment be um, appropriated, uh, you would have recourse in arbitration or against premium, you can take a political risk insurer. And this is an important segment in our um, value proposition as a jurisdiction. Now, uh, the figures were given by the Honorable Minister. We're not going into detail, but why is it that Mauritius is that conducive environment and a value proposition for inbound and outbound India? Uh, we have privileged relationship. The investments have been growing increasingly, and we understand the culture of inbound and outbound uh, investments in and from India. We have an ideal time zone with one hour and 30 minutes time difference, so business can continue after the business is stopped in one of the jurisdictions. We have um, a double taxation avoidance convention with uh, the Indian government that was recently uh, amended and renewed. Um, we have a number of avenues of cooperation which are being pursued, including in the debt securities area, including preferential withholding tax rates. And the Honorable Minister and my colleague Renu is going to talk about later on about our FPI registration in India. Now, the Honorable Minister mentioned the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation and Partnership Agreement with India, which is a free trade agreement that the two governments are signing. This trade agreement has three main chapters, trading goods, trading services, and economic cooperation. And the trading goods is, as you are aware, duty-free and quota-free for a multitude of products. And a number of sensitive products have preferential tariffs or preferential market access. At the same time, the trade and services you have the four modes of supply, cross-border supply of invest of, of services, um, consumption abroad, movement of people, amongst others. At the same time, an interesting um, chapter is the economic cooperation chapter, where the two countries are trailblazing a number of initiatives 
for the benefit of operators in India, in Mauritius, and the wider international investing community. Um, this, uh, this agreement is going to be to leapfrog the ability of doing business between the jurisdictions and from the jurisdiction through Mauritius into Africa and to other emerging markets. Now, I'm just going to go into a little bit more details in terms of a few products that I want to highlight during this presentation without taking too much of time. The first one is going to be the family office um, scheme that we have. So Mauritius has positioned itself as a jurisdiction for cross-border investment, but at the same time for private wealth. And basing on all our instruments, which I'm going to talk about in the next slides, we have created the single the, the family office scheme in Mauritius. There are two prongs to it, single family office and multi-family office. Each family office would have to have a minimum investable worth of more than $5 million of dollars and is still a, 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 an impaired capital. The beauty of the family office in Mauritius is the ability to use underlying structures, which I enumerate in my next slide. So Mauritius has had um, a number of structures used for uh, wealth and estate planning, including trusts and foundations. Our Trust Act of 2001 is mirrored on the British Trust Act, and you have discretionary trust, purpose trust, charitable trust, and asset protection trust. One of the key features of the Mauritius trust system is that you can have a trust in the absence of beneficiaries. There can be a purpose trust, you can have a discretionary trust, and the set law can have reserve powers as well. The reason why Mauritius is used increasingly uh, by the exceptionally affluent is because of the confidentiality. You can migrate trust, therefore, if you ex have an existing trust, in a common law jurisdiction, you can migrate it to Mauritius, but at the same time, should you wish to move out of Mauritius, the exit mechanism is extremely fast, and you can use the trust, um, uh, you can use the migration provisions of the trust to move out of the Mauritius jurisdiction. As a rule of thumb, all of the trusts in Mauritius have a duration of 19 years. Um, and of course, you can use it to circumvent forced hairship rules. Um, international trusts in Mauritius are not taxed, so non-resident trusts and foundations are exempted from taxation. I mentioned earlier that uh, we have a hybrid legal system, so we also have the um, French Napoleonic Code, and uh, by consequence, we have the foundation as well, whereas the trust is governed by a deed, a foundation is governed by a charter, but it is mostly used for wealth protection and private relationship amongst others. So the trusts and foundations can be used as underlying instrument for your family office. And if I may just go back to the previous slide, the family office has a, holiday, a tax holidays of five years, and these, like the Honorable Minister mentioned earlier, the family office scheme has gone through the Code of Conduct Group at the level of the European Union and the FHTP, the Forum on Harmful Tax Practices at the level of the, of the OECD. And they have been whitelisted by both the EU and the OECD when it comes to tax practices. Now, um, another product that is, you know, making headway in Mauritius is the Variable Capital Company. As a number of you distinguished, distinguished guests, you are aware, Mauritius has been a kind of a gold standard when it comes to um, funds and the funds industry. Building on that, we have limited partnership acts. So you have limited partners and general partners as well. You have protected cell companies, which are used for funds, but it's also used for uh, family offices. At the same time, we have introduced a new type of structure in the recent budget called the Variable Capital Company. Um, it is one of the products that has um, seen the light in Singapore and Cyprus, but its salient features in the Mauritian ecosystem is going to be that you have the ability to have more than one investment compartment. You would have the ability to pay dividends from the capital itself, which is very prominent for fund managers. It is of an indefinite duration. And then, of course, by the name, you have the ability of, of redemption of shares, and you can increase or decrease your capital as and when you go about 
the 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 ecosystem. Now, two products that I'm going to talk about for cross border after talking about wealth is going to be the headquarters scheme. If you have a company and you're doing business across the world or in emerging um, in emerging jurisdictions, provided it is in three or more jurisdictions, come to Mauritius, set up your headquarters in Mauritius. The requirement of substance for you to set up your headquarters in Mauritius is not that onerous. You need to have a minimum OPEX of 5 million of rupees, minimum of 10 people in the jurisdiction, and your physical office. And from there on, you conduct all of the activities that I have enumerated in the screen, and you get a tax, tax holidays of eight years for all income that is accrued to the company. So come to Mauritius, set up your headquarters in Mauritius, and you service your three or more uh, countries that you're servicing out of your business. Now, the second one is treasury management. If you feel you don't want to do your headquarters in Mauritius, set up your operations in Mauritius and do your treasury management activities. You get a tax holidays of five years. Both of these, are, all our products have undergone reviews at the level of the OECD and the EU, and they have been whitelisted. Now, um, in terms of, uh, and I'm going to end on, on this distinguished guest, uh, in terms of the jurisdiction, we have paved the way, the government of Mauritius has paved the way for Mauritius as a fintech hub. There is a multitude of reasons why Mauritius is a fintech hub. Of course, you have your multilingual IT pro professional professionals, uh, our data protection laws are GDPR compliant, and you have state-of-the-art uh, fiber optic connectivity. At the same time, we have what we call a sandbox license uh, in Mauritius. The beauty of the sandbox license is that it is one line. It is one line in the Economic Development Board Act whenever there is, because technology moves so fast that regulations cannot keep up. So what we have to do at the level of the government of Mauritius, we have created a sandbox. So if you have a, a, a product which is innovative, come to Mauritius, set up shop in Mauritius. Um, if it is fintech, we are going to give you a fintech sandbox license. We work together with the Ministry of Financial Services, good governance, with the FI, with the Financial Intelligence Unit, with the Financial Services Commission, and with the Bank of Mauritius as a cohort. And then we provide you with a sandbox license for you to do your activities in Mauritius. And there is a multitude, if I may go back on the previous slide, there are a multitude of licenses that we have already provided um, to the international investing community, including crowdfunding platforms, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, digital wallets, and initial coin offerings. So when you come to Mauritius, even if we don't have, it is one line, um, the sandbox is one line, as I mentioned. So even if we don't have a regulatory framework, we are going to onboard you, and we are going to monitor you, the Bank of Mauritius or the Financial Services Commission are going to monitor you, or end of the one year, they are going to come up with a license. But for that specific time that you're here for one year, renewable, we are going to give you a license with terms and conditions very specific to your business activities and with the commercial viability imbibed upon it. Now, um, at the same time, the FSC has created a number of licenses, including the Digital Asset Marketplace license and the securities token offerings and the custody of digital assets, amongst others. Um, so I'm going to end here. There is a, there is a number of merit, uh, there is meritorious uh, reasons for you to choose the jurisdictions. The Economic Development Board is here to handhold you, as the Honorable Minister ad, um, advised earlier. We have an office as well in India, and Mr. Sivrajan Lal is our resident director in our India office as well. Um, so please feel free um, to, 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 to connect with us, um, to visit our website, edbmauritius.org, um, and to contact us. The details are on the screen. And we'll be happy to handhold you for your expansion in Mauritius or through Mauritius into other emerging markets. I thank you for your kind attention. Over to you, Siraj. Thank you for that. Given the, the entire gamut of what Mauritius is all about in terms of the financial services center and very informative presentation at the same time, the products and services that you have elaborated upon.
and how Mauritius also, I think, uh, provides the best environment for invest investors. So now we will to the next uh, speaker, Mr. Nishit Desai. In fact, I, I must say that Nishit Bai doesn't need any introduction, but just to briefly mention, Nishit is a, Nishit is a founder of Nishit Desai Associates, a research-based international law firm. He played a seminal role in structuring several private equity funds in addition to structuring several domestic venture capital funds. He has advised the Small Industries Development Board of India, SIGBI, and the Department of Electronics, uh, Government of India, and their Domestic Venture Capital Fund. Nishit is a member of an International Bar Association, American Bar Association, Inter-Pacific Bar Association, Low Asia, International Tax Planning Association, and Sup Supreme Court Bar Association. Nishit Bai is also a great friend and supporter of Mauritius. In fact, I must say that he has helped uh, he has helped uh, uh, Mauritius in terms of setting up the International Financial Center uh, back in the years. And also uh, socially uh, in the society, Nishit Bai is very much involved as he's also passionate about supporting social good and under his guidance, NDA, that is Nishit Desai Associates, has remained at the forefront of the social sector in India. He has worked closely with the Nobel laureate Professor Yunus on social issues and personally received the Professor Muhammad Yunus Social Business Pioneer of India in 2010. So now uh, over to you, Nishit Bai. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Siraj, uh, Honorable <coughs> Minister. Wonderful to have you and hear you as well. And <coughs> thank you all my friends. Uh, you've been waiting for quite some time on this webinar. Uh, I know we got delayed by about 15 minutes because of some technological problem, but I think we are in good now. Uh, every technology has its own issues, but I think it, I'm very happy to have heard everything. As you all know, or many of you might know, that um, uh, uh, our relationship with my personal relationship with Mauritius goes back to early 1990s when Mauritius was working on uh, its own financial center. And one thing when I went first time, you know, I, I said was that we want to be one of the cleanest and transparent uh financial center around the world there are many grubby islands around the planet and that has been a consistent uh you know uh motto of uh, mauritius government and um, it has been continuously improving its position even uh, as late as uh, this point in time because there are a lot of new things that keep on coming up and mauritius has been dealing with that india was in similar position uh, and it has been part of fatf now and uh, it also had the same thing. It was stated that India was a relatively young player, and India, in, uh, the just as uh, Mauritius is doing at this point in time. So I think uh, it, this is a process of evolution. But it, uh, Mauritius has also been one of the most cooperative jurisdictions uh, in terms of exchange of information and other kind of um, uh, relationship that uh, India has. But uh, what I would say is that my experience uh, since early 1990s with Mauritius has been, it's been one of the most dynamic countries uh, I've dealt with uh, around the world. And anytime anything comes up, the people uh, in Mauritius are willing to change, willing to come up to the speed, and the decision management is very fast. And I think this is something I've seen every time there was some issue, or otherwise I remember at one point of time, uh, when we set up, uh, uh, you know, first fund in the Mauritius and the second one, uh, one issue came up that redemption of, uh, uh, you know, shares out of uh, the capital that is normal requirement. And in case of fund, if it makes its loss overall, how do you return money to the investors? And immediately in no time that happened. A lot of time, even on phone, they could understand the business issues and come to grips with And at this point in time too, as you can see that number of new initiatives are being taken. Innovation is the name of the game. And it's been fun, uh, you know, working with uh, Mauritius. Um, one of the important thing that we need to now note is that uh, it is no longer only the tax issues or tax exemptions drive our relationship. Yes, until 2017, capital gains was one of the most important uh features of india mauritius treaty after the amendment of the treaty 
of course in spite of that the investment continues to rise the number of companies and funds that are being set up in mauritius now people look at many other things in mauritius one as far as inbound investment is concerned uh, you know uh, interest rate is also one of the lowest uh, amongst uh, the other countries under the treaty it's also we had the until recently bilateral investment production treaty india has withdrawn from i think about 70 80 countries with which we had bits is withdrawn now in terms of indian corporations which are going overseas uh, especially in africa or in some other jurisdiction you know if we have withdrawn from the bilateral protection treaty obviously we also do not get protection in the other country and i think mauritius is now becoming an important jurisdiction for that um, you know, so if you set up uh, your global holding company in Mauritius, I think it can help you a lot in uh, in saving your, you know, protection uh, in African countries and several other countries with which Mauritius has, uh, you know, uh, BATs or bilateral investment treaties, uh, protection treaties. Uh, as was mentioned, even it reduces the cost of doing business. If you have to go into jurisdictions where there are certain political risks, or other kind of expropriation risk, you normally take insurance from MEGA or otherwise, you know. And if you go through Mauritius, maybe you can reduce your premium by almost, political risk premium by almost like 25%, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, uh, and in addition, your uh, protection of investment also remains. Uh, as you could see, the new features that are being introduced now with regard to family offices, again, a regime is being created so that, you know, uh, global uh, family offices can uh, be established in Mauritius. Now, as far as India is concerned, uh, there are some limitations. One, of course, in terms of the remittance of money from India under the LRS scheme of $250,000 is one thing, uh, but also Indian family offices which are LLCs or L, uh, I would say rather uh, LLPs, they might be able to set up offices. Of course, one has to consider it is a financial services company or not, but within those constraints, there are opportunities to do that. Second, there is um, uh, there is a whole regime of different kind of trust. As you know, Mauritius historically, uh, originally it was a French colony until the year 1800 and then became British colony. So. It is based on both the world. So anywhere, uh, you know, this dual system allows you to understand and work in different jurisdictions. So Mauritius system is slightly mixed system, but it has a number of different, um, uh, you know, uh, advantages because it is easier to explain to judges in different parts of the world what this system is all, all about. And um, as was mentioned, there is a, a discretionary trust is known to most of you, no need to talk too much about it. But there is also something called purpose trust, which was interesting to see. Now, normally in most trusts, especially in India, you cannot have purpose trust except uh, for charitable purposes, you know. So in charitable trust, there is no beneficiary, only purpose, right? So what is the purpose? Charitable purpose. But in India, uh, yeah, only for charitable purpose, you can have a, a purpose trust. Otherwise, you have to have beneficiary and settler and stuff like that. In Mauritius, you can have a purpose trust in the sense, it purposes certain purpose, for example, just to hold the shares of a Mauritius company, you know, it is a purpose. And, uh, uh, you know, so purpose trust is another instrument that could be very effectively used. Uh, third interesting thing I found in the presentation that was made that you, and we all know about it, is that you don't need minimum capital. So you can have company without share capital. Okay, so you can, still have corporate structure which can borrow from the world and whatever other kind of stuff you can do. There are many such, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, possibilities. Uh, another thing is the variable capital companies coming up. In fact, I remember it had a protected sale company regime and, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is, a, a, we had set up long ago. And um, in fact, Indian courts have recognized the protected cell company as one single entity as far as taxation is concerned. So like that, there are many types of entities. So when you go abroad, one thing is selection of a jurisdiction. Second is selection of an entity. 
third is selection of instrument to use. So Mauritius provides a lot of different opportunities for structuring and um, working around uh, uh, you know, different situations that may require different kind of positioning. Um, other, other important thing is that um, it now become a global headquarter for uh, the multinational companies. Um, also for philanthropy, you know, because many a times, you know, you want to set up a global philanthropy and Mauritius uh, uh, itself is a good hub. It has, when it has uh, been mentioned, there is a good regime for service providers. And uh, what has been found is that you can have set up charitable foundations out of Mauritius. Now, that is another thing that is picking up. Uh, so there are a lot of interesting situations that one could look at. And um, so in, in addition to, or say rather, in spite of uh, uh, tax treaty being amended, you know, there are non-tax advantages of operating out of Mauritius, and um, uh, which we, some of them we just saw. And uh, it has become a good gesture in its own right. It has um, very good political and economic relationship with Africa, with Asian countries, with Middle Eastern countries, and so on and so forth. It's a, uh, I remember at one point of time, 1990, early 90s, uh, there were no financial services professionals. Okay, today there are this world class community of professionals who understand global financial system, global financial instrument, global, you know, structures and, uh, uh, it's been very interesting to see how fund industry has grown in uh, Mauritius and uh, uh, in fact that has brought a huge amount of reputation to Mauritius uh, and um, you know it's, it's very exciting to see that a small country like Mauritius has been now uh, you know becoming I would say kind of a Singapore of uh, um, uh, Africa and uh, of the world right and um, just uh, I think Singapore, I remember going there in the uh, 70s and 80s and you know, it was a very different place. And today you see it has grown so well. And same way I think Mauritius is doing. Um, and we, are, we have seen one good thing I find about Mauritius, that if you have any problem, you can pick up a phone and get a problem resolved. Somebody is there to hear you, somebody is there to solve you. And by and large, my experience in last almost 30, 35 years with Mauritius has been amazing. And um, I have dealt with a number of small economies in the world, and I think Mauritius has done an extraordinary job, you know. And um, uh, I think at this point in time, I, th I think I, I should sh stop, but we'll be happy to take some questions because I just don't want to be a one-way traffic. Uh, but as I was mentioning today, uh, you know, Mauritius in its own right is becoming a good business center. Cost of, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing business is also low at the same time efficiency is as high as many other places and um, so I think we see many of these advantages um, uh, from Mauritius and uh, you know we have to learn a lot India is uh, coming up with gift city now you know and uh, gift city can learn a lot from Mauritius the world is full of you know it is not so much competition but it is about competition you cooperate and compete and you create a better global financial system, open, transparent, and healthy system. And that is what we all look forward to in the coming times, especially post pandemic. All of us have realized that we did so many things that were not necessary, whether driving car unnecessarily, going to office unnecessarily, so many other things. And now we are able to do a lot of things in a virtual fashion. Environment has improved and, you know, things have been changing. So I think for a virtual, uh, you know, world, Mauritius again stands out in its own right and uh, my all the best wishes and happy to take questions. Uh, wonderful to have uh, an opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, and thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Raj. Thank you for us. And um, uh, Rita and everybody, you know, so it will be very, very good to, you know, um, have you and uh, let's stay connected. and. I'm here right now. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Nishit Bhai. Thank you for your encouraging words about Mauritius. I think you rightly uh, uh, summarized it in terms of moving from a, you know, only investors using it for tax benefits. Now it is more of a value-added uh, platform and all the services are there. 
So now we will move to uh, Renu, uh, Mrs. Renu Odit. Uh, uh, she will now make a presentation from a regulatory perspective. And I'm very pleased to introduce Mrs. Renu Odit uh, to the audience. Uh, Mrs. Odit, she is currently the Director of Authorization and Supervision at the Financial Services Commission of Mauritius. Uh, she is a lawyer by profession, by training, with more than 25 years of experience in commercial, corporate, and financial services regulatory environment across jurisdictions like India, UK, and Mauritius. Over the last two decades, she has gained extensive know-how of the financial regulations and of business conduct in Mauritius for having worked both with regulatory agencies and private sector in Mauritius. In her career, Mrs. Odit has been actively involved in leadership roles and participated in various senior level delegations, national committees, and international forums. She has actively contributed in industry initiatives, government task force, participated and regularly spoken at conferences and workshops, and lately been involved in issues relating to anti-bribery and corruption, gender diversity, and reg tech. Mrs. Mrs. Odit is admitted to Mauritius and Indian Bar. Over to you, Mrs. Odit. Thank you, Mrs. Siraj, for that introduction, and good afternoon to all of you who are still holding on. Um, I think I'll just go very quickly on a few very um, basics, uh, I think. Um, Although it's been said, covered uh, by the minister, covered by Nishugai, covered also by Faraz. Uh, but I'll, I'll just take you through from a regulatory perspective or with my eyes. Uh, I think when it, when it comes to Financial Services Commission, we are the regulator for the non-banking. And we have definitely the central bank, uh, bank of Mauritius for the banking side. And we also oversee the global business. Uh, broadly, this is how it looks like, if you can see on your screen. We have uh, broadly uh, segregated businesses into financial services and global business. Now, global business is something you've always heard of. Uh, today, we sit with global business licenses, which were previously called Category One global business license. Which means, if the for if you if it's uh, there is foreign ownership and the business uh, activities are conducted outside Mauritius, then it's a mandatory requirement for you to have a global business license. Um, in addition, we have something called authorized companies. Authorized companies, again, foreign ownership, but the central management and control sits outside Mauritius. So that makes us different from a global business license. Uh, in global business license, the central control and management has to sit in Mauritius. And also we have a new concept of GIGA, or uh, like core income generating activities, which are listed down in the Income Tax Act and inter alia include the fund and session services and, and, and so on. And it must always have a management company. As com it can carry out any type of financial services as com opposed to authorized companies, they are restricted from not carrying out any financial services companies. So this is how the global business um, is, is carried out. Uh, that's why you see management companies uh, which are as they call it, the TCSPs, uh, Trust and Corporate Service Providers. They are also licensed by the Commission. And we have some who hold a dedicated license of acting as corporate trustees. Uh, as Nishit Bhai earlier said, for the trust regime, we have different types of trust, uh, but you need to have a corporate trustee in Mauritius, for example, for purpose trust. So uh, this is how it looks like. Comparatively, on the financial services side, there is an array of services which, uh, which, which are licensed. And I think it is covered before, like uh, some key ones is definitely the collective investment funds, um, fund, um, see the, the managers, uh, the fund administrators, uh, the insurance companies uh, for the cross borders. I could mention the external insurers or the captive insurance. We also have the whole securities market right, uh, right from the marketplace, the exchange to actually the market makers. Uh, we also have the asset manager. The interesting one there would be the whole investment advisors, investment dealers, uh, they all come holding a financial services uh, activity license, as we call it. Uh, and of course, uh, as mentioned, uh, there are all other specialized services like the tre treasury management, uh, headquarters, family office, uh, digital custodians, they will also all sit in this financial services activity uh, license. And the newest one, which is joined here is 
the fintech um, side services uh, they also come within this section 14 as we call it commonly for the activity license so this is the bigger picture of uh, of the regular of the non-banking world uh, before i go a bit more detail how we do that uh, this is just to put in context that Mauritius definitely sits in uh, the global world when it comes to regulatory standards. So this is how the international cooperation landscape looks like, which means we have to adhere to international practice on transparency and disclosure of information. And this also means that we have to continuously review our regulatory framework, keep it efficient, keep it service oriented, and most important, it reinforces collaboration. Most important ones which you see here on the left first hand column is the multilateral MMOUs where we have, um, which we have with the security, all the securities regulators, which is EOSCO. Um, we also sit in some of the regional bodies, like we have interestingly for emerging market committees where we sit. We also sit on the Africa Middle East regional committee. So I think sometimes they create small focus group for us to interact uh, uh, perhaps better than in the bigger forums. Uh, and, and we also uh, have been the members since, since long, long years to the SADC and the Camisa, which are the regional forums which we, which we have. Uh, it, of course, without not mentioning, uh, in, we, we are a full member of the insurance supervisors and also the pension su supervisors, the IOPS and the IAIS. Uh, very briefly, uh, the new network which we have joined, uh, you'll see in the middle, uh, we have the Global Financial Innovation Network, which we call GFI. Now, these are, these are all regulators which have the mandate of being in, getting into the innovation space. So we are one of the, I think, the island nations or the youngest financial center, uh, um, uh, which we sit there is led by, I think, UK FCA. Uh, and many other many other regulators, and we also in that fintech space uh, entered into an agreement with author in, in for French regulatory authority called Autorité des Marchés Financiers, uh, and we also sit as an ob observer to Islamic Financial Services Board. Um, so I think this this is quite meaningful to mention that there on a bilateral basis, as we always have regulator to regulator um, MOUs or or or. or um, Modus to, to, to interact with. And you will see definitely on the last uh, column, uh, we have one uh, with the with SEBI, Securities Exchange Board of India, which has uh, always been very cordial, very constructive, very fruitful. And the last positive experience and the developments which we had was uh, in uh, getting Mauritius as the eligible country under the FBI regulations uh, there. And so that Mauritius funds are now. Uh, can be registered as category one um, uh, FTIs. So I think that's that's uh, that's on that side. Uh, in terms of capacity building, I would have just mentioned very quickly there is that we have with National Stock Exchange and National Institute of Securities, where which helps us in capacity building, exchanging uh, resources, uh, best practices, and I must say uh, also that. Indirectly, when we have, we also have bilateral or tripartite agreement with our local regulators, like Bank of Mauritius and Mauritius Revenue Authorities. How that helps is that they in turn have, like Bank of Mauritius in turn would have a MOU with the Reserve Bank of India or the Mauritius Revenue Authorities will have with their counterparts in India. So this is how indirectly, the in, it, it just facilitates the exchange of information and very timely, um, I think, decision-making sometimes it does help. And Isamalag definitely, we have lived a quite meaningful experience with Isamalag lately, and we are the founding member in from the FATF perspective. So this is the international landscape within which we exist. Now, moving on very quickly, uh, as a regulator, what is our efficiency factor? Um, I won't go, uh, you have a fair idea about the, about the different products, different uh, services and activities, but I would mention from a licensing perspective, uh, what we've done is we have codified all list of licenses which we issue. So if you visit FSC's website and go under licensing part, you will see that there is an extensive list of all licenses with a code, and that code will also have an application form, uh, a licensing criteria, which is well laid down, 
which means it gives a lot of transparency to what is required. Uh, what we have also uh, brought in is that most of our applications, especially the global business licenses, are on online now. They are on a platform, which means the management company can make the application online, make the, make the payments uh, online. So that just helps and ease off a bit of an administrative burden. Um, exceptionally, since last year, we have been we have made a public commitment uh, that when it comes to funds uh, or managers and investment advisors and dealers, uh, the application subject to its completeness will be uh, processed and, and completed within 60, work, 60 working days. And for global business license, it will be four working days and authorized companies in two working days. Now, I must say here that although it may look 60 working days is very long, um, but I think we, we are not talking about exempt funds. These are funds which goes through. But I think in practice, keeping in mind the completeness of the application and slowly we are bringing in the whole known to the commission concept, which means if you're holding a license one, we make sure that the data is submitted uh, and it is matched and the processing of the application is much faster. So that has helped us to bring 60, 60 days to much, much lower in actually when it coming to, to deliverable. But I must, must emphasize here that at the licensing stage, of course, there is um, robust screening for the UBOs and fitness and propriety of the persons behind those structures. When it comes to uh, the supervision side of things, then I'll spend a bit of time there. I think supervision is definitely a, a bit on our priority and um, some, some definitely I, I've heard some noise as well that we're doing so much supervision and on-site inspection per se that some of our post-licensing uh, approvals have gone a bit slow over the last uh, two, three months and COVID hasn't helped, uh, but we're catching up on there. But specifically coming on the on-site supervision, I think um, because we have had a commitment uh, made at the national level uh, to actually follow through some of the, uh, some of the uh, actions uh, and one uh, being that to introduce the risk-based approach and secondly, to carry out on-site inspections on that risk model um, on in on actually on on site. And uh, I must share some experience here, if you allow me. Is uh, COVID definitely did not help because it came exactly at the time when we had to launch our on-site inspections. But what we did is uh, two or three things. Firstly, is there was a lot of collaboration seen from the industry. I think that was commendable, which helps us to gather a lot of data, a lot of supervisory data off-site, and we could do desk inspect, desk review of that data and prepare ourselves. Uh, so which means two weeks before you will gather that data, you will review it thoroughly so that the point of contact on the inspection physically is just three to four or five days and, and not, not longer than that. Secondly, it enabled us to actually bring technology into the space. So we automated our uh, our uh, our on-site um, uh, model, model and brought technology in it, which really helped us to firstly have efficiency and secondly have more of ob more objectivity into our assessment. And third thing is that it helped us to bring our supervisory uh, resources together, mount up special team so that people are equipped to do that job and that gives a lot of diversity and a lot of versatility to the job they do. So I just wanted to share that experience with you. Um, and definitely I must say, so we've completed nearly 300 plus inspections in so doing. Um, of course, from that outflows what I have on the last side, the enforcement. Uh, now what we have done, enforcement is a very independent, independent mechanism which we have at the commission in the sense that there's enforcement committees, which are internal, but very, very apart from the supervision and, and, and side of business. And we also have a very independent financial services review, pan, review panel, which is ad hoc. Uh, and lately, August last year, what we have introduced is the, the administrative um, penalties regulatory framework, which is on the civil side. It gives a very early and effective resolution of the Enforcement enforcement matters, and and I think that is something very new in the in the regulatory in the regulatory space. Uh, just to give you a bit of visibility on the risk uh, on the risk based supervision, I think this was one of the actions under our uh, outcome uh, three uh, that we had to introduce that. Otherwise, regulators always have a dilemma as to the role and the responsibilities they have. 
and allocation and the limitation of the resources and where they will allocate it. So what uh, was done, I think it all began uh, from the significant efforts which, was, which were made over the last two years, especially 2018, in carrying out a national risk assessment for the country. So that actually gave us the sectoral risk. And then last year, what we started was the identifying the entity level risk and for, for which we introduce a risk based uh, service and that was compiled. Uh, so on that basis, behind the scenes of introducing, of course, uh, the new legislation, which the minister mentioned earlier on, the FIAMLA was, uh, uh, was upgraded. We also introduced the UN target financial sanctions uh, uh, related to terrorist uh, proliferation legislation against all that. What we managed to do is we managed to risk profile uh, all our licenses, particularly those carrying out financial services. We rated them between low, medium, high and very high. So what that did, this gave us the probability of the risk and or the threat of damage or the loss or any negative occurrence which can sit in those spaces against the external vulnerabilities. What we also did in this whole exercise is made us uh, made the licensees do a self assessment of the strength of their compliance controls so that we can have idea about the residual risk. Now, when we carried out on site inspections, this is the effectiveness of those controls against the vulnerabilities against the risk was carried out and that basically helped us to calibrate our licensee population in these four category category. So I think carrying out an inspection cycle uh, in such a short uh, space of time, although technology enabled, although pooling all of our resources in the collaboration, but I think this risk based supervision is there to stay. So it really helped us a lot. So I just wanted to share that experience with you. The next is I think you've heard the numbers. So it is just to give you a pictorial picture very quickly of the evolution of our funds when it comes to the portfolio investments into India. So as you could see that uh, despite uh, the changes in the treaty in, some, in 17, uh, it has been on, 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 on the rise. Uh, so you will see from the value of the uh, total portfolio investments, which is around 40 billion, the numbers is around 1000 plus as we spoke about. But I think very interesting, interesting would be the next slide, which I'll just want you to uh, just see and, and, and hear me out on to the next slide. Now on the next slide, when you will see the first one up here, uh, this you will see the both the portfolio investment and the direct investments. And what we have done is we have broken it down into Africa and India. So you will see from the for the last five years, and uh, unfortunately I don't have the statistics ready for the 2020, so it will stop at June 19. You will see that for India it has been always been in the 50% ratio. So although in December 2017, it went up to 59.6, nearly 60%, but then thereafter it has remained to 53.6 and, and, and so on. Uh, compared to Africa, you will see it's nine point, around 9%, 9.9 on 10%. Now the second, the middle uh, box you will see, that is with respect to the entity registration, the GBC is involved when it comes to portfolio investments. And the trends again are maintained. You will see when it comes to India, again, if, from the entity perspective, it is almost in last year, 35.7%. Um, and um, for last five years, it's been from like 40, 48, 44, and now come to 35%. All, although one can argue that with the current uh, COVID and the, the challenge we have, would these numbers we be retained? Uh, but as a regulator, you always want to see the numbers in rise. Uh, but Africa, comparatively, you would see is always been in 16 to 17, 15 to 17 percent uh, range. Now, the last one, which is again interesting, so which is actually at again uh, GB, the entity level, uh, this is for direct investments. Now, direct investments, you will see the numbers are reverse, uh, as you can easily guess. For India, it's just in 23 percent. It's been in the range of uh, nearly 25, 24, 23 percent over the last three years. But when it comes to Africa, for direct investments, you will see the rise in the numbers of the entities set up there. It's nearly in the 35 to 37 percent over the last three years. Uh, so, so definitely what that shows, 
is that there is some long term long term investments and the potential to grow in Africa for the direct investments. So I think that's where uh, the trends are, are showing. So I just wanted to share that with you from an FDI and an overall perspective. Uh, now, coming next to succession and estate planning, I think uh, this is already touched upon uh, on the existing choices which we have on the trust foundation protected cell companies. They've been there, uh, I think, since the beginning of 2000s. Uh, so I don't have much to say there, but I would just uh, mention when it comes to trust, um, it always need, I think the protection you have is that um, the settler can himself be a trustee, a beneficiary, mm -hmm. man, right? Yes. And one, and you really require to also have a qualified trustee, which is usually the management companies, and which sometimes administratively becomes very, very helpful. So I think this is this is definitely the requirement. But of course, they have to keep uh, the information on the beneficiary loan, beneficiaries, and so on. And the last one, which is added there, you would see is that when it comes to purpose trust. Uh, they, there was an amendment made in 2011, I suppose, where perpetual duration has been removed. So, which means you know, there is no ceiling of 99 years, which is there for other type of trust. So, I think purpose trust, which could be charitable or even non-charitable. So, I think that is a very interesting feature. Um, when it comes to foundations, again, you can. There is always a council and a secretary, which is usually the management company offers those sort of services here. Uh, these are flexible structures to retain controls over the foundation as compared to trust, uh, I think, and uh, and they can have their own charter. So I think, again, a very flexible. It's a tested route. Uh, we do have quite a sizable uh, amount of trust and foundations in existence. PCCs, I think, it's been extensively used when it's coming to uh, especially fund structures because they, they are restrictively allowed on to only four or five type of activities, including asset management, Fund and uh, fund management, specialized funds, external insurers, and and so on. Uh, interesting features, of course, you all know that the segregation of assets from one cell to another, another it avoids contagion. Uh, but most important thing is that there is a feature of not only incorporation but also continuation. So, which means it can continue, it can move, migrate from other jurisdictions to Mauritius, which is not available in all 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 cases. Uh, and then definitely. Uh, one cell, when it if it's in some um, ad, ad, adverse situations, then administration order and the receiver receivership order can be made specifically to that cell without affecting the whole entity. So it's quite like, it gives a bit of flexibility for investment structuring. Now the one which is added to this uh, as as a private wealth or a solution is definitely the family office. I think uh, we, we it's, it's been mentioned. The only thing, some features I will draw attention, I think that is important. Firstly, it has to be wholly owned by family clients and exclusively controlled by family members or family entities. I think that's the requirement. Activities, you will see it's a broad range of activities which are covered from simple thing as considerate services to actually wealth planning, to taxation, accounting, reporting, risk management, um, and, 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 and so on. So there is it's quite a diverse uh, range of uh, choice there. Um, and then definitely this is one of that uh, license where there's a minimum capital requirement, I must say, compared to what we've said before. So there's a requirement for a single uh, family office to be at $35,000 and for multiple $70,000. And I think just again, I would mention here that there's also a requirement for a designated officer. Uh, who have who is required to be senior manager so that uh, that person can be interact with the regulator and help in all the administration and the compliance requirements and uh, and also there is a requirement to have a PI cover uh, against any fraudulent activities and any breach of any professional duties uh, and any loss of data so that caveat is already added in the family rules those who haven't seen I encourage you to please have a site. Uh, on the family rules. If there's any comments, please, please feel free to pass it on to us through EDP or, 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 or otherwise. Um, now, another one which is added, uh, again, keeping in mind the private wealth uh, uh, um, side, as it was mentioned in the blueprints came out, is the investment banking. We do have currently around six investment banking banks which are licensed. Uh, now, when it comes to investment banks, the activities are where there is four or five activities which, which are allowed. One can uh, ask, why do I need to ask uh, apply for an investment bank? 
the whole purpose is that instead of applying two, three separate licenses, uh, that it's much more easy to actually come for an umbrella license and have a choice of carrying out five activities under one license. And these are investment dealers, which is full dealer service, including or excluding underwriting, investment advisors, un unrestricted investment advisor, corporate finance advisories, if you have to provide asset management and distribution of financial services and products. So this is basically this uh, again uh, for this license being a financial services license. There is again a minimum capital requirement of 50 million and uh, we've just reviewed uh, this uh, this rule. I think some sometimes last week where we have uh, added on one more condition that the shareholders or the promoters behind that they should have experience in this line of activities, which is at least five years and uh, and invest a bit in the senior officers as CEO, for example, having a 15 years of experience in similar activities. So that's for our new uh, license investment banking. Um, on the securities, uh, on the fintech side, I, I think securities token offerings, um, I, it sits very well, uh, keeping in mind our whole evolution and the gold uh, products, as you said, uh, funded funds. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this is the second step from a fintech strategy uh, perspective to add that, where, whereby we are saying that uh, securities, as long as they fall within our traditional space, um, as defined in the Securities Act, but represented in a digital format, um, and they hold economic rights in shares, debentures, derivatives, units in a CIS, they can actually float securities token offerings. Uh, and and it is offered to sophisticated investors, expert investors, PCIS and collective investment schemes. This is what is the actually, uh, and again here, um, in addition to the offerings of the securities token, uh, it also provides for the licenses of the security token trading systems, which means if an applicant wants to come both offer the uh, tokens and also want to uh, manage and float the platform, they can do both. So, which means a trading trading platform is equally possible to be licensed under the security token offering rules. And again, for the for the platform, uh, there is a minimum requirement of 35 million and uh, PLTs. Uh, of course, those are the criteria which are which are which are looked at. And I, I will come very quickly. This is the last one, and I won't spend a lot of time on that. This is the digital custodian. Again, this is a part of the fintech strategy uh, to actually provide for the custody services for the digital assets. Uh, digital assets are have been defined, which means any tokens in electronic or binary form, uh, which either gives holders the access rights uh, to a service or ownership. Uh, so now this is uh, this this has been floated. I think last year. I would really ask you to uh, please uh, have a sight on this one. Uh, I think this our this digital custodian uh, rules have been very well received by some other leading financial centers, and they've been following this as well. So it does uh, uh, provide for uh, common wallets and having single address and a lot of features which I think are very very modern. Um, so I would invite you to please have a look at it and any questions will be, I'll be more than happy or will be more than happy. To okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Renu, for this, uh, you know, for this, uh, expose regarding the regulatory perspective and the different new products that uh, we are coming up with. So, uh, we have exceeded our time by, I mean, if we minus the 15 minutes of, uh, technical glitch that we have, we had. So we have exceeded by 15 minutes. So probably we will take a couple of questions because I see there are a number of questions that have come up. If that is okay with you, uh, Renu and uh, Faraz, and also finish it by a couple of questions that will be okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. Okay. Okay. So okay. So so uh, we we go to the first question. So um, where is it? Okay, there are certain questions uh, like about the cost and process of opening and all that. So that I think we can we can reply to that bilaterally on email because uh, that that will be easier for for this thing. So there is one question in terms of you know uh, the views on Mauritius uh, versus Singapore as a tax jurisdiction and the ease of setting up the fund. Second question: Do you think uh, Cayman will come in FATF clearance as well as I don't think Cayman uh, is a uh, is part of this discussion today, but probably on the Mauritius, uh, a Singapore as a tax jurisdiction and the ease of setting up the fund. Probably Faraz and, and uh, a Red, you, you, you can look at it. Uh, 
uh, I, I think uh, when it's our, I, I think I would take a step back. I think the way our fund industry has evolved has been very different to some other jurisdictions. For example, uh, the investment funds which we have, they've always been regulated rather than merely registered. Uh, in addition to the investment managers or the advisors around that. So, of course, that that brings uh, brings a bit of more uh, scrutiny when it comes to the licensing regime or uh, uh, and so on. What we have done over, over, years, what we have, over some time, what we have done is try to bring in uh, more efficiency in terms of our either by our technology or by our data key data gathering in the sense that uh, as some of the jurisdictions have done that bring that concept of known to the commission which means has already passed through the regulatory net and what we are trying to make sure that the second or the third times let's say there's one or two or five funds set set up then they don't have to really get into that long queue and wait for nearly 60 days to get a license we move much faster on around that and i must Quickly add here when it's when our national risk assessment was done uh, for some reasons, and I think it's the same for other other jurisdictions as well. Uh, investment funds definitely come up a bit higher on the on the risk category as compared to perhaps an insurance uh, or or investment holding. Uh, so I think that that explains the reason uh, why. And, and technology definitely helps in all cases. Online platform completeness of the submission of the data. Update, uh, the quality of the business plan, I must say, to spend a bit of time, um, the constitutive documents comes in. I think there's, all these things do help us to uh, register uh, the funds much quicker, but yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else want to contribute? It's fine. Uh, the, does the Mauritius uh, VCC product, will, will it also include the redomiciliation of the companies in, in comparison to Singapore? Yes, absolutely. I think one of the things that we, whenever we come up with a new product is that we benchmark and then we go beyond what other jurisdictions are doing, principally because it is to have a competitive edge. Um, at the same time, migration and redemissiliation has been part of the DNA of the Mauritius jurisdiction. And absolutely, I mean, for all products that we have, we will have migration abilities uh, for funds or VCCs to redomicile in Mauritius and vice versa. Um, so this will be part and parcel of the new product offering that is going to come through the VCC rules. Okay. And if I, and if I may just add very quickly to what Farah said, I think uh, this applies to all our structures yeah. under our Companies Act here, uh, that there is a feature there which provides for the continuation of foreign companies in Mauritius. So it's embedded all across. In the Companies Act, yeah. the migration. Uh, for, a, for a long period of time, we have uh, done a number of redomiciliation. One of the requirements, there is something called exporting jurisdiction and importing, importing being Mauritius. So the law of the exporting jurisdiction should also permit export of an entity. I think that is another thing that one needs to bear in mind. So you need to have uh, integration of two jurisdictions because if the exporting jurisdiction doesn't permit export, then there is a little bit of an issue. But otherwise, uh, Mauritius, as uh, we have seen many uh, transitions, but are very smooth, no problem. Yeah. Good. Yeah, uh, maybe we'll, we will take one last uh, one last uh, question. It's about uh, if you can share, like, uh, what would be the most important reason for the USP to consider the Mauritius IFC a solution or any family office future planning or investment planning in terms of their decision making? What are the merits and the demerits of this? Uh, I mean, of the Mauritius IFC or the USPs. So maybe for us. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll take I'll take this one, Siraj. I think whenever an exceptionally fa affluent family or a high net worth individual is looking at uh, at a jurisdiction for the preservation of his wealth um, and for his estate planning purposes, I think there are a few a couple of things that that he looks at. The first one is stability, whether it is political stability, economic stability, or social stability of that jurisdiction. The second one is the robustness of the banking architecture, and I think that is extremely important. Um, the third one, of course, is openness. Um, how open is a jurisdiction? Is there um, a exchange control or their capital controls in terms of mobility of capital? 
And the fourth one is exclusive lifestyle. Now, um, at the beginning of uh, of uh, my intervention, when the Honorable Minister spoke about it, um, we we are an open country. We are open for um, for foreign talents and foreign investments. We are a hub of choice for international investors. At the same time, um, since independence, we have not had any civil wars or any riots of some sort uh, that meddle the jurisdiction. So we are socially stable. Uh, we have been a model of economic stability for quite some time now. If I may borrow from the words of Sir James Miedi, he said that Mauritius is an over overcrowded barack and is bound for failure. And that was a Nobel Prize, win uh, Prize winner. But that prediction based on economic modeling did not work for the melting pot that Mauritius is at the end of the day, and we have probed ourselves over the years. We have, you know, diversified the economic architecture since the 1960s from a, a monocrop agricultural economy from where we are now. So we have shown resilience. And if you look at the financial services sector itself, it is 11% of the GDP. The GDP is quite um, diversified and, and, and spread. So that provides economic stability. Uh, the banking architecture, I spoke about it earlier, the resilience of the bank. So I think when you look at it, and I don't have to sell you uh, all the, the distinguished guests about um, the exclusive lifestyle that Mauritius has in terms of work, live and play. But for those of our invitees today, if you have not visited Mauritius, do come over. The borders are going to, to, to have a gradual opening as from the um, 1st of October. Um, it is a COVID free slash uh, COVID safe jurisdiction. We have not had any uh, COVID-19 cases for the past four, four months now. So um, zero active cases in the local community. There are a few important cases, but they go on quarantine for 14 days. And thereafter, you know, you are able to go about in, in, the, in the community. So I think seize this opportunity, do visit us. It's a beautiful place, but it's an amazing place um, to do business. If I, this, I think uh, is, is the pinnacle of what we have to offer to uh, four family offices. I just add uh, one or two features here. I think uh, what we have found is comparative cost is also very reasonable, coupled with the high level of professionalism. You know, in 30 years I have seen that uh, professionalism has been very high. It's also uh, many people are, uh, you know, from uh, uh, English bar and at the same time French bar and other kind of stuff. So I think you see fair degree of professionalism. So, you know, you need both. And at the same time, the reputation of Mauritius has been going up. You know, it is willing to do everything, you know, from that, um, you know, uh, from transparency, accountability and other kind of stuff. So. You, uh, you know, you can justify uh, your uh, existence there for a longer period of time. The uh, other other reason I would suggest that you know cost is also overall very good. You know. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nishit Bhai. So um, now we will just end. But just before ending, if anyone among you wants to add, just probably one line before I say I close it. Anybody? Uh, I will just go first. You guys, there are a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, which uh, we didn't have time to provide an answer, but the EDB is going to 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 take that over, and then we are going to write to to the people who ask the questions and and, and provide answers. Yeah, but I think. Yeah. Um, but I, if I may just add one thing, uh, least polluted country, so it's good place to go and be there. Also, I think residency permit is now being granted more freely. But for family offices, I have a question. In Singapore, if you establish family offices, then you get, uh, you know, a residency. And uh, in Mauritius, I believe you have citizenship scheme as well, which has come up. Uh, so, if something could be talked about it, you know, because I think it's a, it's a, as I mentioned, uh, you know, for family to settle down, it's very good depending on at what stage of the life you are. But um, it's, it's the least polluted country, and uh, it's a beautiful place to be in. 
yeah. maybe just to add and so is that uh, we do have that uh, uh, residency by investment it used to be five hundred thousand dollars and we have reduced it to three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars now so if the you know the uh, owners of the family offices if they wish to invest in a property or in a project in Mauritius they will be uh, definitely be eligible for that residency and which is like for lifetime if if they take a residency it's it's going to to be for lifetime so that is there and one more point before I, in fact i talked to prime minister of mauritius to have a dual citizenship uh, agreement and at least citizens of mauritius should be able to take indian uh, citizenship and india should offer dual citizenship uh, for indians who want to be i think that would integrate because at the end of the day i think we see that mauritius is mini india in many ways you know yeah. and um, it would be wonderful to have that kind of integration and extended family. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll take that up. Uh, but Mauritius already allows for dual citizenship, but we have to have an agreement with India so that, you know, uh, Mauritian passport holders can have Indian uh, um, uh, passport as well. Yeah, yeah. citizenship. So okay. that, that will take it up. Yeah. In, in comprehensive treaty. Yeah. <laughs> So we will. But, you know, this, sorry, I will take one, one, the thirty seconds more. Um, okay. Citizens of Mauritius already have uh, what we call uh, overseas uh, uh, OCI, overseas citizens of India scheme. Yeah. So that would be just a graduation of the OCI uh, yes. for, for yeah, the two national yeah. yeah, yeah. This is the you can remain prime minister about this. I, I, <laughs> I yeah, would distinctly yeah. remember my conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, yeah. it's been wonderful I, this afternoon. It's beautiful uh, here and also in Mauritius. I think all of us. Thank you all for joining. Uh, grateful to you all. And yeah. again, over to you, Suraj. So yeah, yeah, I, I would like just just like to say thank you to everybody. I mean, to the wonderful audience, the lovely people who have stayed with us for almost more than two hours now. So thank you for everybody to everybody and thank you to the panelists. Uh, the minister had to leave uh, the, because of other commitments. But thank you to you, Nishit Bai, for, for all your support with your team. I think your team has done an excellent job, uh, the team in the background also. Same thing at the EDB Mauritius, Faraz and uh, Renu from FSC. And the team at uh, in, behind the scene, uh, I, here I would like to mention Anju and Mitija, who have been very helpful and supportive, working with your technical team, with Arya and Milin and all of them. So. Thank you to, to everybody. And uh, this is, I think, uh, is something that we have done a great job here. And we will be in touch with all the participants and uh, we will continue the conversation probably offline, but also with Nishit, we will see how we can uh, collaborate further and uh, on other support, on other, on other initiatives that we can take forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.